Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking about masks, the latest on when, where, and how to wear them, and how physicians should communicate this to patients. I'm joined today by, today by Dr. Mina Davaluri, a urologist and health outcomes fellow at Cornell NYP Medical Center in New York. Dr. Megan Srinivas, an infectious disease physician and translational health policy research fellow at UNC, delegate for the AMA RFS and the AMA RFS member on the AMA Council on Medical Service in Fort Dodge, Iowa. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's chief experience officer in Chicago. Well, the last time the, uh, the three of us spoke was in July with the launch of our Mask Up campaign. At that point, the message was pretty simple. It's where was where one. Now it's kind of more like where two, and it's become a lot more complicated with the vaccine rollout going uh, on. In fact, the CDC just released guidance for fully vaccinated people, uh, including revised guidance on masking. So let's talk about how physicians can help patients understand when the advice gets more complicated. Um, why don't you start, Dr. Davaluri? Sure, Todd. And, and it is, it is. I just have to say, you know, tremendous, though, how far we've come even since the last time we've talked about this since July and, and the degree of masking that we've seen has been has been phenomenal to see that uptake sort of happen through the fall and winter, though it, it's certainly been, uh, it's had its challenges. Um, so I think that being said, you know, it, it's a constant conversation, right? And, and as we had alluded to previously, it's something that will evolve as our data evolves and as as our vaccination rollout evolves. And I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind when we're talking to our patients is to just continually communicate with them. Um, you know, as a urologist, a lot of my patients are elderly. And so it's a conversation that I have, you know, how are you doing? Are you masking up? Are you doing okay with COVID? And as these changes happen, just trying to help them um, clarify any questions that they may have. And even if they don't have any questions, just reminding them that, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, reassuring them that as long as we keep up some these these public health measures, you know, as simple as 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 wearing a mask, um, we will eventually uh, reach that light. Um, but and we all have to work together. I think that you know one thing that's been different about this pandemic is you know the it's kind of been evolving in terms of a lot of this data. I don't think people are necessarily used to that and used to guidance changing kind of month to month. Are you finding you know people are confused by that, including kind of the latest round of updates? Uh, you know, I think I think um, people are more tuned in to the pandemic now than they were, you know, a year ago as this started. Uh, people have become more familiar with the fact that things are changing. You know, things do need to be reiterated, but I think in general, um, at least in my experience here in New York, people people are a little bit more aware and um, and have learned to kind of modify modify their changes. I mean, the amount of people that I see adhering to the two mask mandate is quite incredible. I, and, and, and Dr. Srinivas, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, unfortunately, I wish we had the uptake that you guys did out in New York. I think it really, there's such a regional variance, unfortunately, and a lot of that is set by the political tone of each state, since we didn't really have a federalist strategy. We went by a state-by-state -state basis since the start of this. And so depending on who is the spokesperson in your state, I think it's changed a lot of the messaging and created confusion. So in a state like mine, where... Unfortunately, we never really had a mask mandate, and even the the little flimsy direction we did get was quickly repealed. It's been very confusing because people are hearing Dr. Fauci, they're hearing the CDC, and they're hearing the President Biden's task force saying all these things are contradictory to what they've been told at the local level. But that's why it's so important that all physicians, such as Dr. Davalori, even though you're not an infectious disease, the fact that you're a urologist and that you're a doctor, you see a whole different subset of patients than I might see and that another physician might see. And at such confusing moments, the local physician is who people turn to and trust. And that's why your voice and so many others are so important in just reiterating even the simple message of, yes, we need to wear a mask. Yes, there is hope. We have a vaccine coming and down the line we can see is returning to more of a normal life, but it's so contingent on following those safety precautions right now. Dr. Srinivas, can you talk about kind of what is different? You know, what's the news in the guidance that's come out, uh, especially in regard to those that are, you know, getting vaccines? Mm -hmm. So one of the big things that did come out recently from the CDC just this week, which is good news, 
is that we can start having small indoor gatherings amongst people who are fully vaccinated without necessarily needing to have the same level of safety precautions we'd had before. But the worry that I have with this is how it was portrayed in the media, because a lot of the media doesn't necessarily interpret the guidelines as strictly as the CDC intended them to be. And so a lot of the headlines just read, indoor gatherings now safe, which is not true at all. At it does point. cut off some of the important information in that guidance. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this is exactly what you were getting at, Todd, and what you were getting at, Dr. Davalori, about how there's mixed messaging and misinterpretation because the guidance is now getting so specific and detailed as to who can qualify for what. But even amongst that guidance, even when the CDC said that we can start having these small gatherings, they're not talking about, you know, getting together for spring break and having people all travel to, to a house and fly in or trying to have those additional exposures. They're talking about the grandparents who live 20 minutes away who haven't been able to see their grandchildren because of the risk of exposure and transmission, who now are fully vaccinated, can come into that grandchild's house and be able to take care of them and help be a part of their life again. We're talking about still taking minimal risks, still taking a lot of precautions, but doing it to try to bolster some of those human connections and that mental health that unfortunately has been waning during the pandemic. Well, uh, Dr. Davaluri, you know, there have been questions out there, you know, from people saying, well, if I have still have to keep wearing a mask, why do I need to get a vaccine? Is there enough incentive for people to kind of move into, you know, getting vaccine for especially those that are hesitant? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Todd. And it's one that I actually have been asked, you know, as, as, a, as a physician in my office. Um, and I think, you know, what Dr. Srinivas said is, is, is exactly the point for that, is that, you know, we're starting to see that if we are vaccinated, we can start to see ones that we love that we haven't seen for a long time. But we have to keep in mind that even though we're giving out 2 million vaccines a day, there is a lot of Americans that still need to get vaccinated. And until we can really effectively get an appropriate vaccine you know, rollout, we have to continue with the simple, simple measures of masking up. And we can't let our guard down on something that we've spent so much time trying to develop um, behaviors for and something that's so simple that we know can prevent the spread so easily. And so, yes, it is still a, a long, long tunnel. But to get us to that point of having a hopeful future, we need to continue to mask up. And so while it may seem like there, it may seem counterintuitive of continuing to have to do it, we have to remember that it's just because we're trying to get vaccines out to as many people as possible before we can start to slow down on some of these measures that have been so protective. Dr. Srinivas, anything to add from your perspective as an infectious disease specialist and, you know, person who, you know, works with uh, uh, the vaccine hesitant and, and, and particularly in marginalized populations? Yeah, there, there's so much going on, especially with that last component of what you're saying with marginalized populations. But to touch on what Dr. Davalori was saying first, she's exactly right. And the two things that I often use to communicate to patients as to why it's important to continue mask is that even though you're vaccinated, you could still potentially be a carrier of the virus and spread it to other people. So it's about stopping that spread. And that's why wearing that mask is so important. And then the other point is we do have these new variants emerging. The ones out of South Africa and Brazil are so far the most concerning that we have presented before us. And we know that these vaccines that we currently have are not as effective against them as they are against the strains that they were developed for here in the United States. So because of that and the fact that there are unknowns, we still have to take some of these safety precautions until we get more information. But like Dr. Davalori said before, it's been lightning speed, the amount of scientific information that's been garnered in just the last six months to a year. And if we continue on this pace, which it really appears we are, those questions are going to be answered soon. So it's a matter of getting the vaccine, continuing to mask to protect yourself, your community, your family, but also starting to take the guidelines as a CDC brings them out one step at a time to get closer to normal life while still taking these precautions in hand. Right. Um, uh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, I think I think along that, those lines, like a fun sports analogy I love to use um, when I'm talking to some of my patients, it's like, you know, you're ahead in the first quarter, right? Or in the first half of the game and you're at halftime. And if you come back out thinking, oh, I've got this great lead, you know, I don't need to do anything else. I can sort of play play not my best, you know, maybe put in a couple of players that haven't gotten a lot of time yet. Um, and suddenly you lose that lead and you're, 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 you know, in those, that last minute of the game against the buzzer trying to get that lead back. 
And right now we're in the lead, we're doing really well with our masks, and this is not the time for us to, to drop those precautions. Yeah, some terrible sports analogies, but I do understand we still have time on the clock here. <laughs> Um, Dr. Srinivas, uh, you know, we talked before about different states and different requirements. We've got 34 states now that still require people to wear masks, five states that had mask mandates that have lifted them, uh, Iowa being one of those states. You know, what advice do you have for physicians who, are, like you, are living in states where, you know, the restrictions have been loosened at this point? There's been so much mixed messaging out there that a lot of people don't know who they can turn to for advice. So they're often turning to their local physician, to the people that they had trusted before the pandemic, people that they've had relationships with, both personally as well as medically. And that's why the local doctor, whatever your specialty is, is so important. The local public health official, because you're the one who they're going to turn to and listen to. You're their neighbor, you're their community member. So when there's mixed messaging coming from up top, from both the federal and the state side, in states like mine, it's really the local level where we can make a difference. So just using your voice and sharing what you truly think, not letting it be marred by politics and just go straight based on the data, based on the science, based on the fact that you wanna to explain to your patients and your friends how they best can protect themselves and their families. Dr. Davaluri, you know, we started to see those kind of horror pictures of uh, spring breakers just, uh, just, you know, descending on Florida. You know, are we seeing a change in mask wearing among younger people since we, we talked the last time? Yeah, I think, you know, Todd, I think overall uh, the mask uptake has has certainly gone up since when we spoke, you know, in July of 2020. I think that that is that is a fact. Um, I think that there's still again, just as we we mentioned earlier, there's so many geographical variations that we do it and these areas that tend to have lower mask mandates are just attracting people who may have mask fatigue. Um, and, um, and, and catering to some of these um, younger populations is really important. Catering our message into these younger populations is important. And we have seen an overall improvement, um, but there's still a lot of work that we can do because again, it's hard for young folks who are in college who may wanna go to their first spring break, not be able to have those experiences. And, and like I said, it's just, it's a little bit longer, a little bit more of a push from all of us as a whole, and we will get there. And it's just it's just reminding them of that of that end goal messaging. Well, last question, really, for both of you. Uh, it's been it's interesting having talked to you kind of on both ends of this uh, pandemic so far. You know, you both have been really strong and vocal mask advocates. You know, why why is this issue so important? You you feel like you're making a difference. Anything that you've learned uh, over the past year? It's really about communication and how one simple intervention that is scientifically found really can't have an impact if the public doesn't understand why and the public doesn't hear from those that they trust why to do it. At a time when misinformation was at a high, partnering with local community members, but also with journalists in the local media is so effective. And that's a partnership I hope that medicine continues to have that interdisciplinary relationship because they are so critical in relaying the real messaging to the public and the public trusts them because they come into their home every day at 5 p.m. And we can really help to make sure the right information is getting out there using them. Dr. Davaluri? You know, it's been, it's been quite the experience um, kind of traversing the waters and the changing landscape over the last, you know, it's crazy to say now, but it's been a year, right, since we first had our lockdown happen a year ago, um, right around this time. Um, what I have personally found uh, to be a huge tool and a huge asset is just, you know, as Dr. Srinivas has said over and over again on this call, is that direct relationship that we as physicians have with our patients. Um, in my own personal experience, I, I do take that time to ask the patients about things, um, whether it's you know, related to how they're urinating or whether it's just related to how their mental health is throughout the entire COVID, you know, COVID era. And just giving them that opportunity to speak to a physician about it and opening up that dialogue, I often find um, allows them to ask questions that they may just not have had the opportunity to, to ask or they may get this mixed messaging from. Um, and I had one experience where I remember one Friday, I, you know, right as the vaccine rollout started in December, um, I asked all my patients who were over the age of 65 if they were going to get the vaccine. Um, and I had about four or five patients who were hesitant who said no. 
And uh, I spent them spent some time. I talked to them about it, and all of them said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into getting the vaccine." Um, and my favorite thing about that was I tweeted that uh, just to share it with the medical community. And the amount of responses I got from other urologists around the country and other physicians that said, "Hey, I'm doing the same thing," and I talked to my patients about X, Y, and Z um, about their concerns for the vaccine, about the concerns for COVID, um, and you know any concerns they may have about the side effects of the vaccine was so overwhelming overwhelmingly positive. And to me, that was just such a, there's so many negative things we've heard that have happened from COVID, but there have been a tremendous amount of positive, positive things that have happened. And I think the physicians have sort of come together and keeping that messaging unified, um, keeping you know our patients' health and their wellness as our main priority, um, as long as we focus on that. It, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to see the, the community come together. Well, people do trust their physicians. And so it's so important the work that you continue to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Davaluri. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srinivas, for being here today and sharing your perspectives. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment tomorrow. In the meantime, for more information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care. <laughs>